Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Mystery of Three Quarters by Sophie Hanna. So this is a new Hercule Poirot mystery, all licensed by the Agatha Christie estate and whatnot. I'm going to start by reading the blurb, and then we're going to go through and look at some of my tabs, and then I'll give you my overall thoughts at the end. Murder? Me? How dare you? Hercule Poirot's tranquil afternoon is ruined when an angry woman accosts him outside his front door. She threatens to report the famous detective to Scotland Yard for falsely accusing her of murder. Seeking sanctuary inside, Poirot is startled to find that he has a visitor, another stranger claiming to have received a letter from Poirot accusing him of killing the same man. How many more innocent people have been sent letters? If Poirot didn't send them, who did? And who is Barnabas Pandy, the alleged victim? Is he dead or alive? Poirot has answers to find, and quickly, or more lives may be put in danger. Okay, so I'm going to go through and pick up some of my different bits. One thing I will say straight away that I noticed is that I think she overdid it with the French a little bit, because obviously, you know, Poirot, you know, Belgian, he speaks a bit of Belgian French, but in the original Agatha Christie books, he does do it, but he doesn't do it anywhere near as much as he seems to do it in this. Like, we're talking, like, most pages. What I think is funny as well is that so these accusations of murder have been levelled at these characters, but then they level accusations of, against Poirot and they don't believe that he didn't write it. And so he then gets to experience the injustice of like these ostensibly false accus uh, accusations as well. There's a great quote here from John McCrodden. His father is, uh, I think it's called Roddy the Rope McCrodden or something. Uh, he's a hangman. Roland McCrodden, that's the one. He's a solicitor. And uh, anyway, John, the son, says, The rich who need money least, like you, like my father, will stop at nothing to get their hands on more of it. That's why I've never trusted it. I was right not to. Money is corrosive to character once you're accustomed to it, and you, Monsieur Poirot, are the living proof. Because again, he thinks that Poirot's been paid to write this letter accusing him of murder. I think this is a great little sum summation of what kind of happened there. Poirot returned to his chair in a state of agitation. What hope was there for justice or peace to prevail in the world when three people who might have made common cause, three wrongly accused people, Sylvia Rule, John McCrodden and Hercule Poirot, could not sit together and have a calm, rational discussion that might have helped them all to understand what had happened. Instead, there had been anger, an almost fanatical refusal to entertain a point of view other than one's own, and the ceaseless hurling of insults. Not from Hercule Poirot, however. He had behaved impeccably in the face of intolerable provocation. I like this little exchange here. Um, so this character said, uh, It is true that I have saved a life many years ago. Poirot says, A life? You said lives. I only meant that if I had the opportunity to do so again, I should save every life that I could save, even if I had to place myself in danger to do so. Her voice trembled. Is that because you are naturally heroic, or because you think other people matter more than you do? Poirot asked her. And she goes, oh, I'm not sure what you mean. We must all put others before ourselves. I don't pretend to be more selfless than most, and I'm far from brave. I thought this was quite funny as well, so one of the characters who's been accused of murder, it says here, then her manner changed. There was a flash of something in her eyes as she said fiercely, People mind so much less when old people die, which is dreadfully unfair. He had a good innings, they say, as if that makes it tolerable. Whereas when a child dies, everyone knows it's the worst kind of tragedy. I believe every death is a tragedy. Don't you think it's unfair, Monsieur Poirot? I mean, if you believe that every death is a tragedy, then you should probably go vegan, love. Just saying. I'm allowed to say that. Poirot here, he nails this. This is great. It is February, said Poirot crossly. To go to an English seaside resort in February is to invite misery, is it not? Yes. Yes, Poirot, it is. Uh, and then this woman, uh, what's her name? Uh, buh, 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 buh. I actually don't know what this, this... I don't think this woman's even given a name. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe it comes into play later. But basically, uh, Inspector Catchpool has got s sort of this woman who works for him making some phone calls, and... Um, Basically, so she's on the phone to Sylvia Rule, and Sylvia says, uh, Yes, it's Mildred. She's safely home. Do you have children, Inspector Catchpool? I said I was telephoning on behalf of Inspector Catchpool. I am not myself, Inspector Catchpool. I am not myself, Inspector Catchpool. Damned fool! Did Mrs. Rule not know that women could not be police inspectors, no matter how much they might want to be or how talented they were? The caller resented being compelled to reflect upon this unwelcome fa and fact and how unfair it was. She harboured a secret belief that she would make a better police inspector than anyone she knew. Because obviously this is set during an older time, I suppose. A time at which, um, you know, well, it was sort of the 40s, 50s, I want to say. Maybe a little bit later. I'm not sure when the last Poirot book was set. But, um, yeah, it was set during a time at which kind of women didn't have 
even the degree of equality they have now, which isn't equality, if that makes sense. So we've made a lot of progress since then. But I don't know, it's kind of a reminder that we still have a lot to go, especially when it's a contemporary author reflecting upon that past. And we've got as far to go again into the future, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just thought it was really interesting. So I really like the way that the start of this paragraph is read here, um, because it's relatable to me because I have social anxiety issues. Whenever possible, Roland McCrodden replied in the negative to the social invitations he received. Once in a while, however, he felt duty-bound to attend events that he knew he would not enjoy, and the Law Society dinner was one such occasion. The din alone was nearly enough to make him turn on his heel and leave, all those open mouths filling the air around him with pointless chirping. Everybody seemed to be talking and no one listening, as was always the way at such gatherings. McCrodden found them draining in the extreme. I thought this was an interesting little exchange between uh, uh, John McCrodden and, and this woman. That he can't even remember her name. And she says, I suppose you'll promise to take me out again as soon as you can and then I'll never hear from you again, said the woman resentfully, tears forming in the corners of her eyes. No, I'm promising nothing and I don't want to take you anywhere. I enjoyed last night, but that's all it was. One night. You won't see me again unless by chance. You may scream at me as you leave if it makes you feel better. But he kind of has his reasons for that as a relate later. I'm not surprised that he has issues and with trust and stuff, you know. I thought this was a great little quote from Poirot. He says, Hatred can survive long after the one who inspired it is gone. Well, that's why sometimes you have to let go, you know? I like this little exchange too. Uh, Human relationships are extremely complicated, said Poirot. People make them more complicated than they need to be, said Lenore disapprovingly. Very true. I thought this was a great little conversation here as well. This, this, this character's a kid as well. He says, People are really rather grotesque, aren't they, Freddy? Timothy had said this morning. Especially when lots of them are gathered together in one place like now. That's when I really notice it. Or at school. I don't think much of our species on the whole. I agree with you, Timothy. I like this little this little conversation here. Uh, Sorry, sir, said Freddy. I should think so too. Now, have you by any chance seen Mr. Porrot? Who? The French gentleman. The fossil was talking about the egg with a moustache, Freddy realised. He's Belgian, isn't he? Not French. No, he's French. I've heard him say French-sounding things since he got here. Yes, but have you seen him, laddie? Just sort of very typical of, you know, a certain type of British man who uh, wouldn't distinguish between French-Belgian and Belgian-Belgian. Timothy gets this little uh, quote here as well. Timothy gets some great quotes, actually. He says, um, Well, let's hope not, said Timothy. I miss him, of course, but, well, if people have to die, and it seems they do, it's far better if they're murdered. It's so much more interesting. Hush, Master Timothy, Kingsbury scolded. That's a wicked thing to say. No, it's not, said Timothy. Honestly, Freddy, every time I say anything that's true, somebody gripes about it. I sometimes feel as if the whole world is conspiring to turn me into a liar. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to highlight from this one. As you can probably tell from how I've been talking about it, I did enjoy this one. The only things that I really noticed was that A, Poirot was treated a little more kindly than Christy used to with him. And B, as well, he, uh, he spoke a lot more French in this than he did in the original books. And it was kind of jarring because it was noticeable. But other than that, I think uh, Sophie Anna did a great job. And it was just, it would have stood up well upon, on its own without Poirot being a character in it. And with it being just, you know, her own her own universe i guess so because of that i gave it a four out of five and would recommend it if you're a big christie fan and if you ran out of all the original ones to read but you still want to read more christie this is basically the best you can get from there so there we have it that's what i thought of the mystery of three quarters by sophie hannah as always don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so what you thought of it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more and i'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye bye